Hi, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. Today's episode is going to be a fucking doozy. This episode is going to be about Mark David Chapman, the man who killed John Lennon. If you didn't listen to episode one, that episode is about John Lennon and his life. So if you want to learn more about that, go back and listen to it, because his life was a lot more interesting than I had realized. So like I said, this episode is going to go into the murder of John Lennon, and we're going to do a deep dive into the mind of the man who killed him. Before I get too far into this, I do need to give a big trigger warning. This episode contains graphic details of not only stalking and murder, but it also has a lot of graphic descriptions of suicidal thoughts and actions as well as psychosis with auditory and visual hallucinations or delusions. For my sources for this episode, I read quite a few news articles and things like that, as well as the books that I mentioned in part one. I watched a few interviews too, because man, this guy, Mark David Chapman, just loves to talk about himself. But the main source for this episode is the book, Let Me Take You Down, Inside the Mind of Mark David Chapman, The Man Who Killed John Lennon by Jack Jones. The book is exactly what it sounds like. It's diving inside the mind of this man, which is absolute chaos. The book is based on more than 200 hours of interviews with Mark David Chapman, as well as interviews with his friends, his wife, people who worked with him, and, you know, therapists and professionals, things like that. With that said... A lot of what we know about Chapman is from his own account, and the guy is known to live in his own little fantasy world. Like, he's a pathological liar, but he also truly lives, like, in his own little made-up world. And a lot of times when he speaks, he sounds like he's writing a book, like he's very dramatic and just, well, a storyteller. Well, this is going to be a long fucking ride, so let's get right into it. Mark David Chapman was born in Fort Worth, Texas on May 10th, 1955. His parents were named David and Diane Chapman. Mark weighed almost 12 pounds at birth. His mother, Diane, was panicked that something was wrong with him because she knew back then that nurses would lie and try to keep a straight face if there was something wrong with the baby just to avoid upsetting the mothers. So she insisted and insisted on seeing him before they even finished cleaning him up. So they eventually brought her the baby and she saw that he was fine. He was just, you know, a chubby little baby. Mark's mother, Diane, was a really sweet and whimsical woman. She doted on Mark and she always told him he was a good boy. He was very well behaved and he rarely cried. He did have a habit of rocking back and forth when he was a baby to the point that he would actually rock his crib across the room. Diane became worried and she took him to a doctor, but they told her that it wasn't anything to worry about and that he would eventually grow out of it. He never did grow out of it. At least as of this book, which came out in 1992, he had said, To this day, I still rock back and forth sometimes. Mark remembers his mother as a very extroverted and expressive woman. She made very little effort to hide or stifle her emotions and her thoughts from Mark. Like, she would cry during movies in front of Mark and never shied away from showing those feelings, and she would be the one to answer difficult questions for him, like, why was I born, or what am I supposed to be? She would encourage him to explore his thoughts and his feelings and to use his imagination. She was a free spirit and very creative and imaginative. Diane always told Mark that he was brilliant and special and that he was destined for greatness. She totally inspired him and made him believe that he could be a brilliant writer or anything he wanted to be. The only problem was, while Diane and Mark were, like, living in this world of whimsy, she never taught Mark about the real world or how he would have to work hard to achieve these dreams. As an adult, he kind of just expected things to be handed to him in life. Mark's father, David Chapman, was a total contrast to Diane. He was a staff sergeant in the Air Force, and he was discharged shortly after Mark's birth. Then he moved to Indiana to be with Diane and Mark, and he decided to pursue a new career and a new education with the new GI Bill for military veterans, and he got a job working for the American Oil Company. Diane actually worked as a part-time nurse for a while to help put him through college. Mark describes his father as emotionally distant and abusive. 
One of Mark's most vivid childhood memories is of his family having Thanksgiving dinner and everything was all set up and Mark and his sister and their mom, Diane, were all waiting for David to come down to the table. David then came down the stairs muttering to himself and he went to the table and grabbed this steaming turkey with his bare hands and just slammed it onto the table. He never explained himself or apologized or ever acknowledged that he had done that. On another occasion, he supposedly pushed Mark's face into a plate of spaghetti. David also abused Diane. Mark recalled seeing his mother running through the house and running through his bedroom with her clothing all messed up, just trying to escape David. Sometimes Mark would wake up in the morning and his mom would be in the bed with him and she would be completely battered. When Mark was about 10 years old, Diane started crying out his name for him to help fend off David's advances. Mark had to physically place his body between his mother and his father and, and even threatened his father. Diane has admitted that she wasn't much like a mom to Mark as much as she was more like his best friend. Psychologist Alice Hoagland said that male children thrust into the role of surrogate spouse and protector of their mothers often grow up with incredibly grandiose ideas about themselves, and that the child at an early age learns the bizarre message that he's so powerful he can take care of the most powerful person in the world, his mother. The family eventually decided to move to the South, to Decatur, Georgia. Mark recalls having little pockets of inexplicable and violent impulses that he had no control over. He says he felt like a normal kid in his early years, and then suddenly he started to get these occurrences, mostly in school or when he tried to interact with other kids. He just didn't fit in, and other kids teased him, and he felt alienated and didn't know how to defend himself. One day at school, a bigger kid gave him an atomic wedgie, and he did this on the playground in front of like 20 or 30 other kids. Not only was this painful and embarrassing, but Mark also had a brown stain on his underwear, so everybody laughed at him and started talking about him, saying that he had shit his pants. Mark never got over this. He defines this as, like, one of the big moments of his life that defined him as a loser. Eventually, Mark tried to be the bully at school to the kids who were smaller than him, but it ended up backfiring on him. One time he decided to fuck with a kid named Artie, and Artie was playing with the ball and Mark kicked it away, and Artie was like, look, stop doing that. And Mark didn't stop. So Artie decked him in the face four or five times. Mark said that he punched back, but only punching Artie's arms. He could never bring himself to hit anybody in the face. He said, this was a fight I picked, and it set a tone for me. For the rest of my life, I would always back down from a confrontation. It made me feel scared inside. It made me a coward. Even years later, when I killed a man, I had to shoot him in the back. There was another guy at school named Neil who would physically bully Mark, so Mark got this idea that he would learn karate. So he called up this karate place and he left a message on their answering machine. The next day, Neil went up to him at school and he had known all about Mark calling them. As it turned out, Neil was actually at that karate studio in a karate class when Mark called and left the message. When Mark was about 10, not only was Diane turning to him for protection from her husband, but she was also turning to him more and more to express her feelings. She told him about how she hated his father and she only married him so that she could have a baby. And she told him that she was worried she was becoming unattractive and that maybe her husband was having an affair. She would also tell Mark that she might commit suicide by the time she turns 50. So from an early age, Mark kind of had this responsibility to take care of his mom, and he had little support to deal with his own troubles. He was feeling like an outsider at school and among his peers, so he ended up turning to his own imagination to deal with his problems. This is when he created the Little People. The Little People were a make-believe society that lived inside of Mark's walls, they worship Mark. He would summon them from the walls to make them work in the stores and the communities that he would envision. He would make them dance for him. And whenever he was angry, like if kids at school were fucking with him or if he was mad at his dad, he would get revenge by murdering the little people. He had a little button on the arm of his couch that when he pushed it, he would imagine all the houses where the little people lived blowing up. 
So he would like push this button and like make these little war sounds like pew, 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 and just like murder all the little people. And then after he calmed down, he would apologize and they would always forgive him. When the little people pleased him, he would reward them with music from his favorite band, the Beatles. Mark used to play them the album Meet the Beatles, which was the only album that he owned. He had built a little cardboard stage and used action figures or like little army men to make little Beatle characters to play with. He used to sit and stare at the album cover and just observe the faces of all the Beatles. There was something about one of the guys that he didn't like. It was John Lennon. He said it was his lips. He had thin lips he didn't like. Sometimes Mark would sit on the floor of his bedroom for hours just listening to this album and rocking back and forth in front of the little stage and like reciting the lyrics of the songs and then applauding at the end of each song. He would beam the music signals into a pretend sound system in his brain so that he could broadcast the music into the homes and the shops of the little people. Mark says he doesn't know exactly what age the little people showed up, but he feels as though they were always with him and they knew everything about him and had been everywhere he had been. At first they were invisible and then one day he saw them going in and out of their homes and he thought it was really odd that nobody else could see them. The first day that he saw them came after a restless night. He was having a hard time sleeping because he could hear his parents fighting and his mom crying out in her bedroom. He also had gone to bed with a fever and a bad cold that night. Also, he had just seen a movie called Toby Tyler, which was about an orphan boy who ran away from his cruel uncle to join the circus. Mark's parents had remarked to him that he looked like Toby Tyler and that he was handsome just like Toby Tyler. And one time, Mark's father took him to a Toby Tyler circus. And when Mark got home, he went back to his room and lost himself in imaginary adventures for several days. In his mind, the little people somehow had to be connected to Toby Tyler. So the morning that Mark first saw the little people, he was sitting in his room trying not to think about his mom crying the night before. So he was sitting on the edge of his bed with his head lowered and he was beaming the Beatles music to his little Beatles toys. He was rocking side to side and he looked straight ahead looking closely at the walls and he finally just saw the little people picking up his signals. They started singing along and smiling and rocking their bodies with Mark and they would cheer and they would chant, Mark the king of music, Mark the king of the little people, long live the king of the little people. So now Mark's looking at his walls and he can see like an entire city. They had these big screens that were broadcasting Mark and Mark starts to address them saying, listen, remember what I've been telling you guys about my parents? Well, it's happening again and you guys have to make my dad stop hurting my mom. Later on, Mark heard his dad's car start and leave the driveway and he noticed that he was home alone. He went to the den and put on a Beatles record. He started rocking furiously and summoned the little people down to his den, and when they started showing up through the walls, he slowed his rocking to the beat of the music. He was listening to the song Little Child by the Beatles, and he changed the words and sang, Little people, won't you play with me? Little people, you must stay with me. As the song ended, he laughed out loud at the new lyrics he had made up. He stared back into the walls and suddenly he thought about his parents again. Without any warning, he rapidly started moving his fingers like he was pressing imaginary buttons in the arm of the couch. And then he started making his little kid war sounds like the shooting and explosions again, the pew, 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 pew. The little people inside the walls started screaming and falling to the streets. Buildings tumbled as they screamed for help under the rubble. And he said, I'm sorry, but that's what happens when I get angry. A few years later, he had forgotten about the little people, and then he discovered masturbation. See, Mark didn't know anything about sex. He didn't even think about it until he was about 13, and he saw something on TV about it. Or, he saw it happening on TV. So he asked a friend about it, and his friend explained sex to him for the very first time. Mark was shocked and appalled. His parents had always slept in separate rooms, and he just couldn't believe what they did in order to have him. 
especially since his mom had told him that she didn't even like her husband and she only stayed with him to have a baby. Mark thought the whole idea of sex was just really dirty. His friend also told him that if he put his hand in his pants and rubbed himself, it would feel good. Several months later, he was watching a movie with Doris Day in it, and he remembered what his friend told him. There was something about Doris Day that aroused him for the first time in his life, but he didn't know what to expect, so he was really surprised and frightened when he ejaculated. It freaked him out, and he fought the urge to run to his mama. He actually thought that he had injured himself. After he discovered masturbation, he would masturbate up to seven times a day. He would fantasize about older, mature women, like women from TV or church or something, or sometimes it would be like teachers, but he never felt that sense of arousal with girls his own age. Mark would sometimes have fantasies of all these women that he thought about being lined up like chained up in a secret dungeon of the basement of his school. In his fantasies, he almost never had sex with these women. He just made them touch him and give him oral sex. His mom would make comments about his masturbation that really made him uncomfortable. Like, she would grab his underwear from his hamper and, like, dangle it and say, I know what you're doing up there in your room. And that made Mark feel really exposed and violated. When Mark was 14 years old, he discovered psychedelic drugs. The Beatles had really shifted in style by then. They were really like an entirely different band. So by this point, the Magic Mystery Tour album had come out, and the Beatles now had long hair and were into meditation and drugs. Mark gave himself the nickname Mark the Freak. This was like a new druggy persona he gave himself, but along with it, he felt like he finally belonged with a group of people. In fall of 1969, Mark was a freshman in high school. Everybody noticed the change in Mark at this point. He went from being a clean-cut nerd to this mysterious hippie, Mark the Freak. Diane says that this was the year that Mark had become, quote, a stranger in his own home, an alien creature she and her husband could no longer either control or understand. She says that she grew to fear her son, and she believed that he held a mysterious power over them. Mark was one of those guys that would get high on marijuana and LSD, but he would also pretty much get high on whatever he could possibly find to get high on. Like he would sniff glue and lighter fluid on his way to school in the morning, he would do small doses of acid in between classes... One night, he snuck out in the middle of the night, and he went and did acid with a bunch of his friends in somebody's basement. When everybody went to sleep, Mark found himself unable to go to sleep, and he noticed that there was a knife in the room. All of a sudden, he felt the urge to pick it up and murder everybody in their sleep. He didn't end up killing anybody that night, but this was the first sign to Mark of how bad his rage was. On another occasion... Mark got into a confrontation with his father, and he grabbed a knife that was nearby and went after him, but his father was able to grab his arm and twist it backwards until he dropped the knife and was just like, okay, okay, it's cool, man, it's cool. Mark was using a lot of LSD by this time. In 1970, he ran away to join the circus. He planned this elaborately. He kept it a secret and was really mysterious about his whereabouts even with his classmates, so that his parents wouldn't know where to find him. Mark said he couldn't explain it, he just had to leave his house. So Mark came up with the plan to move to Miami, but he told all his friends that he was actually going to California. He started saving his lunch money and setting aside clothes for this trip. Weeks before his trip, he called a taxi company and arranged for them to pick him up from a movie theater and take him to the airport. So he had his mom take him to the movies, and he told her that he was meeting up with friends, and then he snuck out through a rear exit and took a cab to the airport. He bought a one-way ticket to Miami, and then he went back to the cab driver and had him take him back to the movie theater. And then he made plans with his cab driver to pick him up in two weeks at a diner at five in the morning. And this cab driver did it. He took this 14-year-old kid back and forth to the airport and didn't even question it. So anyway, the flight was two weeks later. 
Mark woke up before three in the morning and put on a disguise, which was like a hat and sunglasses, and he walked out of his front door with the suitcase. He walked to the diner, just totally anxious, thinking that a policeman or somebody was going to stop him. I mean, he was actually kind of doubtful that the cab driver was even going to be there. When he got to the diner, he bought himself a cup of coffee, which was actually his first cup of coffee ever. This moment felt like the beginning of adulthood to Mark. He had gone to the airport in nicer clothes, trying to look less like a sloppy hippie, just so that he would blend in a little more. When his plane landed in Miami, he went to the bathroom and he put his hippie clothes back on, bell bottoms, a leather jacket, sandals, and he dumped his hat and glasses into a trash can. He left the terminal and he walked up to a cab driver and said, Take me where the freaks are. (laughs) Sure you did, Mark. Mark didn't know a single soul in Miami, and he had no idea where this cab driver was taking him. He had $30 in his pocket, but he supposedly had a sense that he would be able to find food and shelter once he ran into some other freaks, and they would recognize him as one of their own and accept him into their little tribe. The driver dropped him off at the beach, and he started walking along, looking at the faces of others passing by. He studied their behavior and listened to their conversations, just hoping that somebody would stand out, somebody who seemed to be a freak like him. He walked around for like an hour before he finally sat down. He stared off into the ocean, feeling overwhelmingly lonely. He had planned everything out and didn't consider that he would end up alone like this. So he sat there and he meditated for a while, and then he started eavesdropping on this conversation of two young men and a girl who were sitting nearby. They were a little bit older than him, like 18, 19. He started inching closer and closer to them before he tried to strike up a conversation, and he asked them if he could join them. So then they offered him a beer, which he had never drank before. He had literally just had his first coffee like 12 hours ago. So he drank the beer and he hung out with them and he ended up passing out on their beach blanket and when he woke up he saw a couple of teenage guys chatting nearby and he realized that he was now among the freaks. So he tagged along with these hippies for four days. They taught him how to shoplift and how to panhandle and they would all sleep in these concrete sewer pipes at the construction sites near the beach. The only reason that they let Mark tag along was because Mark had a little bit of money. Once it ran out, they started to get tired of him. And because he was so young, he started catching the attention of police officers. So they dumped him. But they told him that they were going to get money and get to the Miami Pop Festival, and they would meet him there. Mark walked around for a while, sticking his thumb out, trying to hitchhike. Eventually, he came across a low-budget carnival. By the way, Mark talks a lot about the child in him and the adult in him. The child in him tends to be the excited one and the one who gets emotional, and that's the one who planned Mark's escape. The adult in him is apprehensive and uncertain, but the child in him needs the adult to carry out the plans. When Mark found this carnival, the child in him was ecstatic. The carnival people offered him food and shelter if he would perform menial tasks around the carnival grounds. His first job was as a security guard. He would sleep on cardboard boxes under tables as he was supposed to guard the food. One day he met a guy named Carlos who invited him to stay with him and his family. Carlos's father felt bad for Mark because he was a little kid, so he let him stay with him under the condition that he would work in their appliance rental business. So during the day he would work, and at night he and Carlos would hang out and look for pot. After a while, Carlos's dad was like, Listen, I know you're a runaway and you can't stay here. So he took him to the bus station and told him to go home to his parents. When he got back home, he was shocked to find out that he had only been gone for two weeks. Later that year, Mark's buddy convinced him to go to a religious retreat. Apparently, he told him that there were going to be a lot of girls there. While there, Mark got reacquainted with a girl named Jessica, who was actually in his second grade class. She introduced him to some of her friends who invited Mark to play in a Christian rock band. On this retreat, Mark was deeply affected by a film that was shown about Jesus. When the retreat was over, he went home and got back into his Mark the Freak identity. There was another time where he went to another religious retreat, and he apparently passed out LSD to young Christian kids who had never taken it before. The following summer, he went on vacation in Florida to visit his grandmother. There, he went in search of the freaks again. 
He found some hippies and druggies to hang out with. He continued to take a lot of drugs, and they started taking a toll on his sanity. He suffered a series of bad trips and flashbacks, and he said he had frightening hallucinations where the world became like a two-dimensional cartoon. One day he was hanging out with all these hippies, and then later on he went to get something out of his wallet, and he noticed that his buddies had ransacked it. Mark felt really low at this point and started crying. By now, Mark was 16 years old, and he decided to turn to Jesus. He stopped dressing like a hippie because he says it just felt right after making this huge turnaround in his life. It was around this time that he would start to voice his intense loathing of John Lennon and the Beatles. He was really angry about the whole thing where John said that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Mark also said that the song Imagine was blasphemy and also a communist song. Mark had gone to a party with his religious friends, and he really wanted to play a song that he had written on the guitar, but the party was so busy and noisy that he didn't get the chance. It bummed him out so much, and little by little, he just stopped showing up to the meetings and kind of started losing his focus on religion. So Mark, again, had a void to fill, and he turned to the rock and roll music of Todd Rundgren, who actually had some beef with John Lennon at one point. What happened was... Todd Rundgren called out John Lennon in an interview in 1974 where he called him a hypocrite. Like, for example, he called him out for the way he treats women poorly while singing about peace and love. He went on to suggest that John Lennon was only promoting these views as a way to gain attention. They went back and forth a little bit, just talking shit about each other in interviews. John would intentionally butcher his name and call him Sod Runtlestuntle and Turd Runtgreen. Anyway, so Mark became a big, big fan of Todd Rundgren. More so than he was of the Beatles. Mark truly felt like Todd Rundgren had the greatest influence on him, and he believed that Todd Rundgren was a musical genius. He felt that his music and lyrics provided everything he needed to express his identity. He tried to get everyone to listen to his music and tell them to really feel it, but nobody was ever quite as enthused as Mark was. Mark started working at the YMCA as a counselor when he was a teenager. He was very committed to this role and later became an assistant program director. Everyone who worked with Mark had nothing but good things to say about him. The kids called him Captain Nemo, which I think was also his idea. This was like another persona for him, just like Mark the Freak. But Captain Nemo was from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and this would set the stage for his later role as Catcher in the Rye. So the thing about The Catcher in the Rye was that the title of the book was about Holden Caulfield, the main character of the book, imagining himself as somebody who literally sat at the bottom of a cliff catching children as they fell off. That might not be the best explanation, but I'll get more into the book later. The point is, Mark was already starting to see himself as somebody who needed to save the children. In 1975, Mark was given a chance to travel to Beirut, Lebanon, but he was only there for a few weeks because the country was in the middle of a civil war. So Mark and another volunteer spent their days huddled under furniture while bombs, rockets, and gunfire went off in the streets. Meanwhile, Mark took a little voice recorder and recorded these war sounds. The volunteers were evacuated, and when Mark got back to Georgia, he was visibly shaken up. So then he was moved to Arkansas to work with Vietnamese refugees, where, again, he fully committed himself to his work, and everyone had nothing but good things to say about him. That year, he rekindled his friendship with Jessica, the girl from the Christian retreat who was also in a second grade class. By 1975, the two were engaged. But just a few weeks before that, Mark had actually cheated on her and lost his virginity to another camp counselor at the YMCA. And he felt horrible and sinful for it. He was pretty certain that she was saving herself for marriage, and he started to despise himself. It wasn't long before they broke off their engagement. He committed himself more than ever to his work at the YMCA, kind of hoping to make up for his mistakes. In 1976, Mark was enrolled in community college. At this point in his life, he really started to feel like a nobody. He had just finished these important experiences, 
like surviving a war zone and working with Vietnamese refugees. And now all of a sudden he's just sitting in community college studying hard just like a normal person like everybody else. But he didn't feel like a normal person. He said, I wasn't in charge of anything. I wasn't in a foreign country taping bomb sounds down the avenue. I was a regular college student with regular responsibilities and studies, and that was it. That was all. I was just like everybody else, a nobody. And when I had to face that truth, my insides fell in on myself. I fell down a dark hole. So what does a nobody do? A nobody gets a nobody job because he feels like he can't handle anything else. Mark really started to struggle with his sense of identity. He felt like he was constantly searching for this personality that he would never find. Before Mark gave up and got himself a, quote, nobody job, he went back to the YMCA for the summer camp. For a short time, he was back in his element and out of his depression. But then one day, he made a comment to another counselor who turned around and snapped at him. This small incident was enough to knock him back into his depression. This is when Mark decided that he was going to go to Hawaii and kill himself. He tried praying, but it wasn't helping, and he was starting to feel like God wasn't there for him. As soon as he got to Hawaii, he was filled with this exhilarating joy of life. His thought was that he wanted to go and spend a week or two in paradise before committing suicide, so he spent like a week just living it up, drinking and partying, and going on boat tours, and he blew all of his money. But he wasn't ready to die yet so he got a cheap room at the YMCA. While he was at the YMCA, one day he got the idea to call Jessica again, his ex-fiance. He told her that he was going to kill himself, and Jessica didn't love him anymore, but she was really, really scared that he was going to kill himself, so she told him to come home, and he showed up at her doorstep, and now that he was there, she let him down easy and told him they were not going to get back together. So Mark spent a couple weeks at his parents' house, and then he got together all the money he had, about $1,200, and he decided to go back to Hawaii, but this time not to kill himself, but rather to start a new life there. He was going to get a job and a house and start over. As soon as he landed in Hawaii, he went, oh fuck, I'm all alone again, and Hawaii is fucking expensive. So this was 1977. Mark spent his days working temporary, low-income jobs that he would often abandon right after payday. Whenever he had money, he would stay at the YMCA, and when he didn't, he would sleep on the streets. Sometimes he would just hang out in a payphone booth and just chat with the suicide hotline. Mark fell into a dark depression and again started a plan for his suicide. He went and bought a vacuum hose, and he drove to an isolated parking lot, and he jammed one end of the hose into his exhaust pipe, and then he draped the other end across his back seat. He sealed up all the edges of the car, and he closed up all the windows tightly. And when he was ready, he got into the car, and he turned on the ignition. He laid his head back and closed his eyes. But then he woke up. He woke up to the sound of a bird pecking at his window. And then he looked out his window, and there was a guy standing there, kind of asking him if he was okay. He got out of the car, and he looked at the hose, and he saw that it had melted. Because it was plastic. Mark took this as a sign that God wanted him to live. Still, he realized that he needed help at this point, so he checked into a mental health facility. He spent the first few days sleeping, exhausted by his thoughts and emotions from the past month, The notes from his stay at this facility state that he was severely depressed and had no will to continue living. And yet, about a week later, he bounced back. He was said to show no signs of depression. After two weeks, he was like a whole new person. He was then discharged, and he came back to the clinic to work as a volunteer. And then his doctor actually supported a decision to hire Mark in their maintenance and public relations departments. It didn't take long before Mark started trying to act like a counselor to the patients. On one occasion, the doctors actually asked Mark to talk to a patient who, like him, had come to Hawaii for a last fling before killing himself. While Mark was still searching for his identity, these doctors really started to take him in and treat him like a peer, and he was starting to feel accepted. He would go out for beers with the doctors and hang out with them and go to dinner. They often had to remind themselves that he was a former patient. One of the counselors noted that he preferred the company of older people, 
While Mark was only about 22, the other employees in the clinic were all in their 40s. And this counselor theorizes that maybe he was searching for parental figures. Then Mark met Reverend Peter Anderson, and Mark told him all about the depression and a suicide attempt and how he felt like God saved him and now he was letting him down by not fulfilling his purpose. Peter invited him to live with him and his wife, and Mark started avoiding the doctors in the psychiatric unit. They became worried when Mark started to withdraw, and they feared that he was just using religion to mask a much greater pain and darkness inside of him. So the staff at the psychiatric clinic did acknowledge that Mark had all these problems, all this anger and confusion inside of him, but nobody had the slightest clue that he might be schizophrenic. During his sessions, he explained that at an early age, he developed parasitic mirror-like survival skills, where he learned to capture and reflect the character traits of people he wanted to like him. He said, Even without knowing it, I would reflect people's own personalities back to them. I was almost always charming to people, until I started reflecting back to them the parts they didn't want to see. Then they didn't want me around anymore. Even when I was very young, my mother told me, Mark, you don't wear well with people. Mark's condition started to improve. He was doing really well at his job, and it made him feel really, really important, like people needed him. His parents and sister went to Hawaii to visit him in 1978, and his father gave him $1,000 as a Christmas gift. Then Mark got the idea to travel to the Far East. His idea grew bigger and bigger as he was influenced by films like Around the World in 80 Days and The Great Race. So he got six weeks off of work and decided to travel around the world. This trip also gave him an excuse to see his travel agent, Gloria. Gloria Abe was a petite Asian woman who was about five years older than Mark, and Mark would call her up often to make changes to his travel plans. He would, like, read about a new place in a book or a brochure, and then he would call Gloria and have her add it to his itinerary. And then he would send her thank you notes, which eventually turned into teddy bears and roses. He started showing up at her job with coffee and pastries and said, you can't possibly work this hard for all of your clients. He was right, she didn't. Eventually, Gloria fell in love with Mark. On the day of his flight, she looked up his address and showed up to his house a few hours before the flight. She put a Hawaiian lei around his neck and gave him a warm kiss. Over the next few weeks, he sent her postcards from all over the world. While he was in Tokyo, he spoke with an official from YMCA who asked him about his work with the Vietnamese refugees. It was at this moment that Mark realized that he had become void of compassion. All the love and compassion that he felt for these refugees had escaped him, as if all that feeling had just dried up, and he felt guilty about it. And then his depression came back as he started feeling bad about not going further with his work with the YMCA. In Thailand, Mark had his first encounter with the sex worker. He went for a walk after having dinner and drinking a few beers, and this woman, who was very drunk, supposedly threw her arms around him trying to make some money. He says that he tried to push her away, but ended up giving in and going with her. In India, he saw the contrast among the poor and the rich, the pain and the desperation that separated the wealthy, quote, phonies from the real people who struggle daily to survive. Mark got back to Hawaii on August 20th, 1978. Gloria was waiting for him at the gate. She ran right into his arms. After that, they were pretty much inseparable. They would go on dates, and when they didn't have a date planned, he would show up at her door with some drinks in him, and he would tell her that he was depressed and needed somebody to talk to. Gloria never turned him away, no matter how drunk he was or how late at night it was. He didn't tell her about his suicidal thoughts or what brought him to Hawaii, but she could sense that he was hurt and he had felt wronged by others. Mark and Gloria got married on June 2, 1979. Around this time, Mark's parents announced that they were getting a divorce. Not only that, but his mother Diane had decided to move to Hawaii. Gloria recalls that in the early months of their marriage, Mark was really torn between spending his time and his money on his wife or on his mother. Diane would even tag along to dinner dates, cruises, and excursions that Gloria felt she should have been able to enjoy with her husband alone. And she voiced this to Mark. But he would insist that his first duty was to his mom. 
Gloria admits that she was kind of jealous as Mark was doing his best to get his mom set up in a nice place, and Gloria kind of pressured him to choose between her and his mother. He ended up cutting off contact with his mother. Admittedly, Gloria hated that she had this jealousy inside of her, and she was working on it. She says that she overcame it a few months before Mark would commit the murder. Mark's father, David, had left Diane with no money and no financial resources, so Mark was pissed, and he felt like he had to help his mom. He said that he wanted to kill his father for what he had done to his mother during and after the marriage. He also recalls feeling a parent-like responsibility to care for his mom after she moved to Hawaii. He told psychiatrists that he didn't actually want her there, though. It was his island, not hers, and she interfered. Mark started to get really annoyed with her because she couldn't stop talking about herself and her new life and her new boyfriends. She would have sexual encounters with beach bums and guys who were about Mark's age. So Mark would get mad at her and he would call her menopausal and then she would get mad as hell. Diane did her usual thing where she would turn to Mark as kind of a confidant instead of acting like his mother. She confided in him that his sister Susan wanted to come visit, but she didn't want her to because she was starting her new life there. And Diane basically moved to Hawaii without a plan. Mark was the one who got her a divorce lawyer and also found her a job and an apartment. Eventually, Gloria made peace with Diane. The three of them would rent a car and they would drive around the island, sometimes stopping for dinner or drinks at an elegant hotel. Their credit card bills started piling up, but Gloria knew better than to question Mark about his spending. Mark says that his lavish spending of money was a way to bolster his self-esteem, which was at an all-time low. He felt ridiculous working as a housekeeper while he was now a married man. He felt like he needed a more important position in life. This is when he became a printer and a public relations representative. This job was prestigious, but it was very demanding and it started to take a toll on Mark's emotional health. He was no longer able to socialize like he did in his old position, and he didn't feel important anymore. And when Mark was alone, he got really, really lonely. And when Mark had too much time alone, it just gave him more time to think and look back on his faults in life. Mark started noticing that his behavior was becoming more and more aggressive. It was like he would explode on somebody, and then when they would react, he would get terrified. Like one time, he and Gloria were walking up the stairs to their apartment, and there were a couple of guys who were talking loudly, and Mark turned and yelled at them to shut up. And then later on, he felt guilty about it, so he went back and looked for them to apologize, and the guys ignored him. After that, I think a few days had gone by, Gloria and Mark had walked by one of these guys, and the guy whistled at Gloria. Mark became enraged, and he wanted to jump up and grab the guy, but he didn't. He was scared. So, they moved. They broke their lease, and they moved to a luxurious condo. One day, Mark went to pick Gloria up from work, and he got mad when she took too long. He laid on his horn, and he started yelling at her. And then he went into the office and started yelling at her boss. Then it happened again another time, and Gloria's boss slammed the door in Mark's face. So Mark made Gloria quit her job. Mark's colleagues also started to notice his increasing hostility. He was not satisfied with his job, so he would, like, create programs and new systems for himself and other people around the job to use. He had this perfectionist attitude that would cause him to become enraged when other people did things differently than how he thought they should be done. He was eventually fired after having a confrontation with the nurse who was asking him about a print job that he was taking too long to do. In December of 1969, Mark got a job as a security guard and basically cut off all ties with his friends from the hospital, who basically helped him find the will to live after his suicide attempt. Mark was in pretty bad shape again. He started drinking heavily, and at some point, the little people came back. But now, they had grown up and they were wearing three-piece suits, and they were here to help Mark organize his life and his finances. And instead of a monarchy where Mark was the king, it was now more like like a democratic parliament type of thing where Mark was now president. So where he used to be the ruler who could just blow them up willy-nilly, now he had to, like, submit proposals to a board and get their approval before making big decisions. Mark would address the little people on this big screen that came down like a presentation in a boardroom, and he would tell them that they're going to be okay financially. 
The little people made him feel like he was running a country, and they were the only thing that kept him functioning. Mark became obsessed with artwork, and he started making watercolor paintings. Gloria recalled that his paintings were really good, but Mark could not leave them alone. It's like they were never perfect, and he would always go back and add to it or try to make it better, until it was just a big, dark mass of color. Gloria said, It's like nothing was ever good enough until he destroyed it. In March of 1980, Mark abandoned his obsession for art and traded it for an obsession with finances. He would get up early in the morning or late at night and sit at the table with a pencil and a calculator and just stare off into space for hours. Sometimes even talking as though there was somebody else there with him. Gloria asked him who he was talking to and he tried to tell her about the little people. He told her about how they were tiny people who lived inside of the walls when he was a kid, but now they were back to help him reorganize his life. Mark's again in really bad shape now, at the lowest of his lows, and talking to the little people and organizing things was the only thing that really kept him going. He shut out everybody around him, and he was so sensitive that he just felt like every single person had let him down or rejected him in some way. He started doing weird things for his own amusement, like calling in bomb threats and making threatening phone calls to his landlord, or like threatening a TV repairman who he didn't like. He had a payphone outside of his apartment, and he would watch it from his window, and whenever somebody was standing near it, he would call it, and when they answered, he would tell them, I'm watching you, I'm gonna follow you and kill you. Sometimes during these phone calls, he would also use a laughing box. A laughing box is this thing that they use during the 70s. It's like a, I don't know, like a prank thing, like, I don't know, like a whoopee cushion or jack in the box or something. Let let me play it for you. So this is what a laughing box sounds like. So yeah, he would play this sound during his creepy little threatening phone calls. Mark also started spending all of his time at the library with the goal of reading every single book. Eventually, he left his job. Eventually, he left his job. It was just too hard and too much pressure. He thought that he could stay home with Gloria and just clean up and cook for her. One day, Mark remembered the book, The Catcher in the Rye, and he decided to look for it in the library. He had only read it one time before when he was 16, and he's 25 at this point. So he looked for it at the library, but the library didn't have it. He came back week after week after week, and they never got it. So he went and he bought a copy, and he started reading it, and he could not put it down until he got to the last page. And then when he finished it, he started it over, and he read it again. Mark related to the main character, Holden Caulfield, a lot. And Mark tends to do this. He sees synchronicities, and to him, they mean everything. Like, he believes that all these things connect in order to give him some kind of purpose. Catcher in the Rye is about a depressed 17-year-old boy named Holden Caulfield. Holden is like an angsty teenager, and everyone he interacts with, he feels, seems to let him down somehow. He calls everybody a phony, and therefore, Mark starts to refer to everybody as a phony. And Holden Caulfield does kind of remind me of Mark, but not in a good way, not, not in a way that Mark should be proud of. Like in the book, Holden calls up this girl who he calls the queen of all phonies, and then he invites her to run off with him. Like if anything, Mark and Holden are the real phonies here. And, and, and maybe that's the point, like they're projecting. So Mark went out and he bought two new copies of The Catcher in the Rye. One copy he kept for himself, and the other one he gave to Gloria after signing it, Holden Caulfield. Mark told Gloria that she should read the book to better understand him, so she did read it. He told her that he was thinking about changing his name to Holden Caulfield. Over that month of October 1980, Gloria noticed that Mark's mood seemed to have improved. He told Gloria and her parents that he was seriously thinking about taking a trip to London, and then this idea evolved, and he said he now wanted to take Gloria and move to England. Then he abandoned that plan altogether and told her, Sometimes I just get so frustrated and bottled up that I just want to blow somebody's head off. On October 18th, after rereading Catcher in the Rye, Mark was at the library and he just happened to see a book with John Lennon's picture on it. The book was John Lennon, One Day at a Time by Anthony Fawcett. He looked through the book and carefully observed all the photographs. 
Remember, by this point, it's 1980, and John Lennon was taking a career break. From 1975 to 1980, John was a stay-at-home dad, and he wasn't releasing any music. So this is now 1980, when John had just gone to Bermuda and written a bunch of new songs. So Mark is looking at these photos of John. He's, like, on the roof of the Dakota, and he's throwing up peace signs. And just like every other book or movie that Mark has ever seen, he got sucked into this book. So he's reading this book, and he's looking at the pictures, and he started to become enraged with John. And it wasn't just envy, he says. But the way Mark puts it, John was a successful man who had the world on a chain, and there was Mark, not even a link of that chain. And then he started remembering when he used to listen to the Beatles as a child, back when he was taught that the world was a whimsical place, where he thought he could be whatever he dreamt of. He said, I thought I loved reality, and I didn't want the world to be the way it was. And then something inside of Mark just flipped a switch. His mind went really dark. He wasn't thinking about murder yet, but he was angry. To the point that he would have destroyed the world if he had control over nuclear weapons. Pew, 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 pew. That's what's happening in Mark's brain. He, took, he checked out the book and he took it home to his wife. And he starts going through it and showing her all the pictures. And he says, the decadent bastard, the phony bastard who had lied to children, who had used his music to mislead a generation of people who desperately needed to believe in love and a world at war that desperately needed to believe in peace. John Lennon saying about imagining no possessions, while really he's got millions of dollars and yachts and estates, and this pissed Mark off. Not long after this, Mark was looking through a newspaper and he saw a picture of John Lennon in the recording studio with an article talking about his new album, Double Fantasy. In this article, apparently John called himself a phony and said that all the concerts and promotional packages and the bed-in for peace were just for publicity. So I couldn't find this exact news article unless, unless Mark is just paraphrasing what's in the actual article. So I found one article from November 1980 from the New York Times where John Lennon is promoting double fantasy. But I didn't see any quotes where John said anything about being a phony or doing things for publicity or anything like that. But anyway, I'll link that article on BrokenLimelight.com in case anybody wants to see it. I just don't know if Mark took this article and paraphrasing what he believes John said. But anyway, whatever article he's talking about, Mark read it and he says that's proof that John Lennon is indeed a phony. By the way, I forgot to tell you about John and Yoko's bed in for peace. This was shortly after they were married and during the Vietnam War. So John and Yoko stayed at a hotel in Amsterdam and they wanted to promote peace. So what they did was instead of doing a sit in, they called it a bed in. They stayed in their bed in this hotel for two weeks. They invited reporters and news crews into their room to publicize it. And they did this a couple of times. They did a few bed ins. But anyway, Mark says that John somewhere admitted that all of these bed-ins were just publicity stunts. So after Mark read the book about John Lennon, and then he sees this article about double fantasy, he then purchased the album Imagine, and this was just another thing to enrage him. John sang about not believing in God and not believing in the Beatles. He only believes in himself and Yoko. Mark describes how all this just made him want to scream, like, who the fuck does this guy think he is? And he just finished reading Catcher in the Rye and still embracing the persona of Holden Caulfield. So he's thinking about how this shitty world and all the phonies have wronged him, and then he comes across this book about John Lennon, who in his mind is now the biggest phony of all. One day, Mark was sitting cross-legged on the floor of his apartment, just staring out the window and holding Catcher in the Rye in his hand. His wife, Gloria, had a few Beatles albums, and Mark started leafing through them, just looking at all the covers. When he got to the Sgt. Pepper album, that's the yellow album with all the Beatles dressed in, like, colorful marching band uniforms, Mark spotted John Lennon's face with his glasses and his little mustache, and at that moment, he just knew that he was going to kill him. He said to himself, wouldn't it be something if I killed John Lennon? Like, huh? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something? What I'm gathering from this is that he's seeing a split between 
the old John Lennon who he knew in his childhood and this new John Lennon who was a father and a meditator. Uh, let me let me read another quote real quick. Lennon as a beetle, Lennon as a phony. Just seeing these terrible inconsistencies, mirroring my own inconsistencies and my own pain and my own guilt at not having accomplished anything. This trinity, the catcher, the new Lennon, the old Lennon, it was just kind of pointing out at me, like an arrow, like the sharpened tip of a triangle, pointing at me. And it was almost like I was handed something, that here was a solution, kill John Lennon. Mark envisioned himself as Holden Caulfield doing what Holden wanted to do, but didn't. There's a part in Catcher in the Rye where Holden finds a sex worker who was wearing a green dress, but when she takes her clothes off, he gets nervous because he's a virgin. He pays her, but then she comes back with her pimp, and they beat him up and they take all his money. Holden then fantasizes about shooting the pimp and killing him. So Mark took it a step further and eventually decided to get a gun. Mark was still in a really dark place, but now he felt that he had a purpose and an identity. Mark would continue to listen to the Beatles records while his thoughts swirled around in his brain. He would take off all his clothes and sit in front of the record player naked, wearing only his headphones. And he prayed, Hear me, Satan. I ask only that you give me the power to kill John Lennon. Give me the power of darkness. Give me the power of death. Let me be a somebody for once in my life. Give me the life of John Lennon. And then he realized he was going to need more. And then he realized he was going to need more than Satan. He needs to make a plan. And so he summoned the little people. Mark told the little people that John Lennon ruined his life and must be stopped. The little people debated and ultimately told Mark, we have unanimously agreed that this is a very foolish, a very non-productive decision that you have made. See, even his subconscious is like, dude, what the fuck? They told him that if he carries out his plan, it'll cause a lot of pain and grief to a lot of people, including to his wife and to himself. But Mark was like, I respect your decision, but I'm doing this. The little people then got up from their table, one by one, and disappeared into his mind, leaving Mark alone. Now, while Mark was praying to Satan and having his little board meeting with the little people in the nude, Gloria was sleeping in the next room. At first, Mark would kind of glance over his shoulder like he was nervous that she was going to catch him. But it's Mark, so he gets all into his moment and he's like chanting to Satan and shouting Beatles lyrics. So Gloria woke up and she woke up to the sound of Mark shouting, Must die! The phony bastard must die! Gloria was scared. Like, on one hand, she's hoping that it's just Mark screaming. On the other hand, she's like, oh, God, I hope that's not Mark. So she's, like, hiding under a blanket, freaking out, shaking. And she tried to call his name, but she couldn't force her voice over a whisper. According to Gloria, it sounded like the voice was coming from two people at once. And it turned into kind of a chant. The phony must die, says the catcher in the rye. The catcher in the rye is coming for you. Don't believe in John Lennon. Imagine John Lennon is dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine that it's over. The music stopped and Mark was silent for a few minutes before he started quietly muttering to himself, The fool. The goddamn phony fool. He doesn't even realize that he's going to be dead. Just imagine that. One day, Mark saw a television rendition of a short story by Willa Cather called Paul's Case, which was about a guy, Paul, who was an artistic and misunderstood man with a morbid desire for cool things and soft light and fresh flowers. No surprise, Mark related to this character. Paul was also a sociopath who was planning to run off with thousands of dollars that didn't belong to him for a final fling that would end in death in New York City. Paul had a suite at the exclusive Waldorf Astoria Hotel. So what does Mark do? He spends multiple days calling the Waldorf to try to make reservations. He finally got a room for two nights at the end of October. On October 23, 1980, Mark quit his job as a security guard. He signed out for the last time using the name John Lennon and then crossed it out. He also pasted the name John Lennon over his name tag before he took his uniform off for the last time. 
On this same day, just a few hours earlier, John Lennon had officially released a new song called Just Like Starting Over, which was supposed to symbolize John Lennon's return to life. I'm going to share another quote from Mark. He said this after the murder about how he was feeling during this time. He said, There was no esteem. Nothing had meaning or value. There was either manic happiness and joy about something new, or there was tremendous depression and drinking and fighting and anger and isolation and fear about other people. I needed to scream, but I had no mouth. Listen to the background of some of the Beatles songs. That screaming in the background, that's John Lennon. Listen to him scream when he's singing about not having his mother. Just to think after a person had been through all that he had been through as a child, then to get murdered by somebody like me. All right, so I'm actually going to end this episode here. I'm sorry my voice just changed. This is me in the future, a few days after I recorded this episode. And part of the reason it took me so long is, for one, I have a cold, and two, I powered through a whole concert yesterday. But this recording is long as fuck, so I'm actually just taking it and splitting it in two, and I'm going to go ahead and release part two right now, and then I'm going to finish editing part three and release that as soon as I'm done. Thank you guys so, so much for your patience. Be back soon with part three. Bye-bye. Hey, future unnaturalists, I'm Emily. And I'm Andy. And we are the hosts of Unnatural, a true crime podcast. Each week, we'll dive into some of the most unnerving crimes that this unnatural world has to offer. Listen for Unnatural on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, make good choices. And don't get got. Bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.